Recently, there's been a lot of buzz about the sugar diet. People have been reporting breaking years-long stalls, reversing insulin resistance, and lots of other health problems. And this has led to people experimenting with other very low fat, very low protein, but high carbohydrate strategies like the potato diet and the rice diet. There has been some discussion about why these types of approaches work. Nick Norwitz presented a very interesting study which found that very low protein diets can increase the metabolic rate by increasing the FGF21 hormone. So this is certainly one explanation for why the sugar diet, the potato diet, the rice diet and juice fasting, etc., produce such impressive results for many people that try them. However, no one seems to be quite sure why these effective high carbohydrate diet strategies also need to be very low in fat as well to get good results. You never hear stories of success from people eating high carbohydrate, high fat diet. No one is losing weight eating chips and chocolate. One of the guesses and stabs in the dark has been this idea that it is somehow because of the Randall cycle. But the Randall cycle doesn't actually make sense of what we see at all. Jay Feldman has done a good video debunking this idea. Another interesting piece of guesswork is this idea that fatty acids block insulin receptors, causing insulin resistance, which causes obesity. However, the science shows that insulin resistance is a completely separate condition from obesity, contrary to popular belief. Insulin resistance does not cause obesity. And if it were the case that fatty acids just bung up insulin receptors, then how do we explain people having lots of success on very low carbohydrate diets? We can't deny many people eat very high fat diets, often for quite a long time, and that high fat diet actually helps them to lose weight. It isn't blocking up the insulin receptors and causing insulin resistance. No, it is clear that fat by itself isn't a problem. And carbohydrates by themselves are not a problem. It is something to do with the interaction between the carbohydrates and the fat. It is this interaction that causes obesity and poor health. So what is the real mechanism, the real reason? Why can't we have carbohydrates and fats together? Why do we have to either choose very low carbohydrate, high fat, or very low fat, high carbohydrate? To understand why we can't have fats and carbohydrates together if we are trying to correct obesity and poor health, it is necessary to update our understanding of the mechanisms involved, the mechanisms which are actually causing obesity and poor health. Accumulating new science is building a much more clear picture of the real mechanisms behind obesity and poor health. We are moving beyond the old guesswork of the past i.e. the idea that insulin and glucose spikes cause obesity and poor health. The new science is revealing that insulin and glucose spikes have nothing to do with the development of obesity. The new science is revealing that the true cause of obesity and poor health is problem bacteria in the gut and deficient bile signaling in the gut. A deficiency of healthy bile signaling in the gut causes obesity and poor health because good biosignaling upholds so many metabolic health systems in the body. Healthy biosignaling maintains thyroid activity and the metabolic rate. Healthy bile maintains GLP-1 secretion from the gut. Healthy bile signaling maintains the gut barrier lining, thereby preventing leaky gut and body-wide inflammation. By maintaining the proper function of these three crucial health systems, Healthy bowel signaling is essential for keeping obesity and poor health at bay. When bowel signaling becomes broken and deficient, these three critical health systems start to fail. And it is this that results in obesity and the multitude of poor health symptoms that we suffer in cultures who eat Western diet. This is the true root cause of all our struggles, our obesity and our poor health. It has nothing to do with insulin and glucose spikes. The science is just not there to support it. We need to shift our attention away from what happens in the blood and focus on what is happening in the gut. So the question then is what is causing this failure of bile acid signaling that is causing all of our problems? It is the development of toxic bile in the gut. This toxic bile activates an important receptor, the FXR bile receptor in the gut. When this important receptor gets activated, 
It does something which has disastrous effects for the whole body. It turns down bile acid production by the liver, and that means there will be less bile acids in the bile. It results in a weak type of bile, which is deficient in the healthy bile acids. So, when there is too much toxic bile in the gut, the FXR receptor gets overactivated, and this turns down bile acid production, resulting in this weak bile deficient in the healthy bile acids, which maintain our health. So now the next obvious question is, what causes us to have this toxic bile in the gut in the first place? Toxic bile forms in the gut when there is too much problem bacteria and too much bile in the upper gut. The problem gut bacteria damage the bile, creating the toxic bile which is causing all our problems. To form this toxic bile, you need both high levels of bad bacteria and high levels of bile to make sufficient quantities of toxic bile to induce obesity and poor health. Therefore, to prevent the formation of toxic bile, we need to either reduce levels of the problem bacteria in the gut or we need to reduce levels of the bile. You don't have to reduce both. Either of these strategies is effective to prevent the formation of the toxic bile. Which leads us to our next question. How can we reduce levels of bacteria and bile in our gut? The two biggest levers which have the most influence on the presence of bile and bacteria in the gut are, can you guess, dietary carbohydrates and dietary fats. This is why manipulating dietary carbohydrates and fats are the two most popular and effective strategies which people use to reverse obesity and poor health. Dietary carbohydrates affect the levels of problem bacteria in the gut. This is because carbohydrates are the essential nutrition which these problem bacteria require to grow and thrive. Dietary carbohydrates foster the growth of the problem bacteria as long as there is also enough dietary protein. And dietary fat influences the levels of bile in the gut. This is because it is dietary fat that triggers the release of bile into the intestine. Therefore, the amount of fat in our diet is the ultimate regulator of how much bile we have in our gut. So because carbohydrates and fats are the two most powerful regulators of bacteria and bile in the upper gut, carbohydrate restriction and fat restriction are the two most powerful strategies we have for reducing levels of the bacteria and bile v a low-carb diet or a low-fat diet. A low-carbohydrate diet starves out the problem bacteria, thereby getting levels of bacteria sufficiently low, whilst a low-fat diet reduces the amount of bile in the gut. And remember, you don't have to reduce levels of bacteria and bile. You just have to reduce levels of one of bacteria or bile. The absence of just one of these prevents the formation of toxic bile. If you are already starving out the bad bacteria with a very low carbohydrate diet, you don't also have to get bile very low by eating very low fat as well. As long as you get levels of bad bacteria low enough with a low carbohydrate diet, you can eat as much fat as you like, triggering bile galore. Because as long as there is no bacteria to damage that bile, the bile does not become toxic and it does not trigger obesity and poor health. And this is what astonishes most people when they first do a ketogenic or a low carbohydrate diet. They're amazed to find they can eat as much fat as they like and it doesn't prevent them from losing weight at all. In fact, it helps because this bile that doesn't get damaged actually helps you to lose weight. On the other hand, if you are eating a very low fat diet, thereby getting levels of bile very low, you don't also have to get levels of bacteria very low as well i.e. you don't have to eat a low carbohydrate diet as long as you are getting fat and bile levels sufficiently low. When levels of bile are extremely low from eating a very low fat diet, you can eat carbohydrates and sugars galore because when there is no bile for the problem bacteria to damage, the problem bacteria stop being a problem at all. Again, people who come from a low carbohydrate diet to experiment with the potato diet or the sugar diet are astonished to see they can get away with eating all these carbohydrates. That's because it is not the carbohydrates per se that cause the problem. 
It is not glucose spikes or insulin that cause the problem. It is the carbohydrate-induced increase in bacteria interacting with the bile that is induced by eating dietary fat. It is the interaction between carbohydrates and fats that cause obesity and poor health. Carbohydrates by themselves do not cause obesity and poor health. Fat by itself does not cause obesity and poor health. And this is why the two most popular diets which people have success on are the low-carbohydrate diet or the low-fat diet. As much as we would love to wish that a everything-in-moderation diet helps us to lose weight, it does not. And that is why the everything-in-moderation diet is not a popular diet, because it doesn't work. You have to either greatly restrict carbohydrates or greatly restrict fat. You have to get either levels of bacteria very low or levels of bile very low. Moderate carbs and moderate fats together is highly ineffective to reverse levels of toxic bile in people who struggle with obesity and poor health. This is because these people have developed leptin resistance, which is a weakening of the gut immune system. These people have to pick a side, either very low fat or very low carbohydrate to compensate for the weakness of their gut immune system and preventing the formation of toxic bile. As a side note, a low-fat diet actually does also target levels of bacteria in the gut. This is because when you reduce toxic bile by eating a low-fat diet, bile acid production in the liver gets dialed up, which increases the concentration of healthy bile acids in the bile. This healthy, concentrated bile is actually highly antimicrobial. It helps to clear the upper gut of bacteria, keeping levels of bacteria down, even though you are eating a high carbohydrate diet, which is more prone to feeding the bacteria. It is also important to mention that for many people, the low carb diet stops working as well, or even at all after a while. This is because gut bacteria adapts to the low carbohydrate diet. It learns to survive and thrive without dietary carbohydrates. Studies have shown that after six months, the bacteria which were massively depleted at the beginning of the low-carbohydrate diet start to bounce back, their numbers start to increase again. At this point, the low-carbohydrate diet has stopped being effective, or at least become less effective in its goal of reducing levels of bacteria. This is when people realize that the low-carbohydrate diet has stopped working for them. They have either stopped losing weight, started regaining weight, and health problems are starting to reappear. In fact, when the low-carbohydrate diet stops working effectively to keep levels of bacteria low, but you are still eating a high-fat diet, which keeps levels of bile high in the gut, at this point you now have a big problem. You now have higher levels of bad bacteria and high levels of bile. This is the perfect recipe for the formation of toxic bile. The high-fat diet and high levels of bile which were helping you when your low-carbohydrate diet was working to keep levels of bacteria low, now is getting damaged by the higher levels of bacteria. Now that helpful bile has become toxic bile. Instead of helping you, this toxic bile is actually hurting you. It increases your food noise, reduces your metabolic rate, increases weight gain, and poor health symptoms and insulin resistance are appearing. When low carb stops working to get levels of bad bacteria sufficiently low, it is not safe to keep eating a high fat diet. Eating a high fat diet increases levels of bile, and if levels of bacteria are too high, at this point you are creating toxic bile in your gut, which will create obesity and poor health in a multitude of ways. At this point, it is time to try the other strategy the very low fat strategy. When you eat a very low fat diet, it massively reduces the release of bile into the gut. It is like turning off a tap. And unlike the strategy of trying to starve out bad bacteria, the body can't adapt to this strategy. If you eat less fat, you release less bile. It's automatic. It doesn't become less effective over time. It works forever, every time. Eat less fat, less bile in the gut, less toxic bile. And don't worry, you still do have some bile secretion, even on a very low-fat diet, even when you're eating nothing at all. But it's below the threshold that activates that important FXR receptor, 
it is when levels of toxic bile are higher that this FXR receptor gets activated and it is that which turns down the bile acid production, creating this weak, defective bile which is responsible for obesity and poor health. So in this video I have explained why you have to pick a side. You, you can't have higher amounts of carbohydrates and higher amounts of fats to get and therefore a very low fat diet is one very effective strategy to optimize bile signaling. However, we can optimize a very low fat diet even further. Combining very low fat with a very high carbohydrate intake and a very low protein intake truly improves bile signaling even more. This is because carbohydrates actually increase bile acid synthesis, creating more of the healthy bile acids that we want. And a very low protein diet helps to starve out problem bacteria, thereby further reducing the risk of creating toxic bile. If you would like to see more of the science which supports the effectiveness of eating a very low protein diet, I have linked that video on this screen. Or if you would like to see what a very low fat, very low protein, high carbohydrate way of eating looks like in practice, you might want to watch the other video linked on this screen. Thank you for listening and hopefully see you in the next one.